mystery that's nagged at police for more than a decade. Who is Air Sally? Nicole Bacolas was reported missing in 2003. I need to know where she's at. What could be happening to her? What condition she could be in is just unbearable. Someone has taken this beautiful young girl and left her out in the mud. Police have launched a murder investigation. Everyone is a suspect in this case. Spirit siblings, and welcome to Outer Darkness. If you're new here, my name is Jen, and thank you for visiting me today. We are going to talk about the legend of Saltair Sally, which is kind of an infamous case here in Utah. But before we do that, I want to thank my subscribers. I want to thank you, even if you're just watching and giving my channel a try. You have lots of other places you can be, and I think that's awesome. And you're awesome. Did I suck up enough so that you'll subscribe if you haven't yet? No? Okay, well, this video will be a little heavier on the history just because I found it so interesting. So let's start at the very beginning. Let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. The Great Salt Lake was discovered by Jim Bridger in 1824, who thought it was actually the Pacific Ocean. I guess they figured that out when they tried to get a drink of water from the lake. That's what this painting shows anyway. Bridger was just 21 years old when he discovered the Great Salt Lake. Several years later, he would actually help guide Brigham Young and the pioneers to their new Zion, now known as Salt Lake. City. On July 24th, 1847, after 17 months of traveling on the Pioneer Trail, Brigham Young, the leader of the Mormon Church, and 148 pioneers were the first to look out over the Salt Lake Valley. Despite being terribly sick with spotted fever, the leader of the church supposedly rose and declared, this is the place. I am sure that there were other pioneers in the back going, this, this is really the place? Because this is... This is not, this is a little desolate, Briggy. I can't say for sure, but what I can say is that life sucked for the pioneers. So ha, ha. they get into the valley in 1847. They start trying to plant their crops and their plows break because the dirt is so compacted, rocky, clay-like soil. Jim Bridger had even warned the saints that they wouldn't be able to grow anything, but they persevered. They were able to create an irrigation system that worked for them and get the crops planted. Then winter hit and it was a doozy. Life was pretty rough. 1848 though, started looking up and these crops started growing. Things were underway. It was going to be the new Zion. Hip, hip, hooray. Oh, it's the rain there. Then Shit hit the fan again when Mormon crickets invaded the valley and began eating all the crops. They were everywhere. The pioneers were terrified because their crops were being destroyed. What were they going to do? So they prayed about it. And of course, God was like, I hear you. I'm going to send you a huge flock of lesbian seagulls and we're going to take care of this shit. Fly, fly, lesbian if you want to fix stuff, I mean... You call the lesbians. We have the tool belts. The Great Salt Lake is home to extensive brine shrimp and salt harvesting operations, magnesium mining, and recreational activities. Not really anymore. It's kind of empty-ish now. But it used to be a great place for recreation, or so I hear. It contributes about $1.5 billion to Utah's economy. The salinity of the lake ranges from 5 to 27% and averages around 12%. For comparison, oceans are only about 3 three and a half percent. So it's quite a bit saltier than the ocean. This makes the water more buoyant. So a lot of people love to float in it. The reason for the high salinity of the lake is that there is no outlet. There are four streams slash rivers that flow into the lake, but nothing can get out. And so the minerals continue to accumulate. The most noticeable feature, however, is its smell. Yeah, it smells kind of like something you go to the gynecologist for, if you know what I mean. Due to climate change, it's actually lost about 73% of the water in it and 60% of the surface area. The lake has sunk so much that scientists have become concerned and have been concerned for quite a while about the fact that there's arsenic in the lake bed. And once the lake dries up, that arsenic is going to end up in dust clouds coming into the valley. 
So we're all going to die of arsenic poisoning, I guess. That's great. Even though this was happening like 20, 30 years ago, lawmakers only recently started giving a shit about it. And they've come up with a few out-of-the-box solutions. That includes cloud seeding, which uses chemicals to prompt more precipitation, or building a giant pipeline to the Pacific Ocean. That sounds doable. Going back in time to 1893, the lake represented a huge recreational opportunity, and resorts started sprouting up along its edges. None would compare, however, to the Salt Aries resort that ended up being built on the lake's south shore. Salt Air was a joint venture between the railroad companies and the Mormon church. It was extremely extravagant compared to the other resorts. It actually became known as the Coney Island of the West, and it represented an opportunity for the church to join mainstream America. The church really wanted to get statehood, and the way to get statehood was to show the government, hey, we're, we're normal. I mean, we have a few extra wives, but we're kind of normal. Have you read the Book of Mormon? Here's a free copy. They also weren't too happy about the other resorts. They served alcohol and got a little rowdy, so the church wanted to create one that was wholesome for the entire family. In the early days, a rail line would transport patrons out to the lake where they could spend the day swimming and floating in the waters. Salter had everything. This place has everything. Cholos, cute people, a sheep there that looks like Bruce Valange, an entire room of puppets doing karate. A boardwalk where there were games, a carousel, dancing in the country's largest ballroom, according to the advertisements, big bands. It even had a roller coaster built on it, as well as a Ferris wheel. You could take tours around the lake. Great for the whole family, all your wives. In 1906, the church sold the resort, but it continued to gain popularity and it hit its peak during the early 1920s. On April 22nd, 1925, however, the salt air caught fire and was completely destroyed. A group of prominent members of the church rebuilt the Saltaire into Saltaire 2 and it offered the same amenities. But it was getting rougher to attract patrons because the Great Depression was starting and we also had the advent of theaters, transportation was expanding, so it was a little more difficult to get patrons. And then in 1931, another fire broke out and caused $100,000 worth of damage. So they struggled through the Great Depression, then World War II came and they just had had a pretty rough time making a profit. Not to mention that at some point, a huge gust of wind that was about 70 miles an hour destroyed the roller coaster. So between all of this and the fact that Lagoon had emerged as a competitor to the resort, the resort's investors started looking to sell it. And they actually approached Walt Disney who said thanks, but no thanks. So they continued to try and make a profit. But in 1958, after so many rough years, the resort closed. And it remained closed for about 12 years, with the exception of its use in a couple low-budget films, one of which has become a cult classic, Carnival of Souls, where the main character walks around the resort and people come and try to eat her and stuff. In 1967, the Beach Boys did take a trip out to Saltair. They were performing at Lagoon, and someone said, hey, go out to the Saltair Resort, hang out there. So they did. They had all kinds of fun, but when they were leaving, they got high-centered on the rail tracks and actually had a difficult time making it to the concert in time. Later, those pictures would actually end up on one of their albums. So in 1970, another fire broke out and completely destroyed Saltair too. Saltair reminds me of that friend we all have where they just have shit luck constantly. Love you. That fire was started by arsonists. The damage made sure that Salt Air was not coming back. So the next time Salt Air was opened as Salt Air 3, they actually built it about a mile away from the original Salt Air site. This time Salt Air, known as the Lady of the Lake or the Queen of the Lake, was actually built using an aircraft hangar, which is very interesting and I guess a lot more durable. It made it less flammable. Also, they got the memo on the impact of salt water and wind on wooden structures, which was a problem with the previous two salt airs. Although it is salt air we're talking about, which means that something had to go wrong. In 1984, another disaster struck. This time, it was a flood. The lower level of salt air flooded so terribly that it sat five feet underwater for the next few years. However, in the 1990s, the Lady of the Lake got another makeover when music industry executives decided to open it up as a concert venue. And it is an indoor-outdoor venue to this day it's actually pretty fun to go out there for a concert. I went to a Lumineers concert out there, but then 
there was a huge storm, so it got canceled. But they did give me my money back, which I thought was very nice of them. So it has become this concert venue that is pretty popular, but it is in a little bit of a desolate area. There's just nothing out there. And it's quite frankly, a little spooky, which is probably part of the reason why it is so famous or infamous for ghost stories and other urban legends. These legends about salt air and the Great Salt Lake go back to pioneer days. In 1877, a group of men working at a salt plant or mine or whatever reported seeing a huge creature with a crocodile body with the head of a horse. And apparently it charged them and roared really loud. These men dropped their shit and ran up the hillside and hid until morning. And then in the 1890s, James Wickham, who was an English scientist, thought that the lake would be a good place for breeding whales because, you know, whales. Anyway, legend has it that he brought with him back from Australia two 35-pound whales, carried them on the boat, sailed to San Francisco, then somehow in the 1800s, transported them to the mouth of the Bear River and released them into the Great Salt Lake. <laughs> They bolted for the deeper water and they were never seen again. It is said that the Great Salt Lake and Salt Air hold many mysteries, including parts of planes that have somehow been recovered from the waters, shipwrecks, but most disturbingly, several bodies over the years have been found near Salt Air. The most famous of which is the ghost of Salt Air Sally, who is said to haunt the grounds of the resort. The story of Salt Air Sally begins on October 8, 2000, when two duck hunters were walking along the shores of the Great Salt Lake and discovered a plastic bag with a sock, a t-shirt, and a choker. Nearby lay 26 bones that had been scattered around, including a skull with long blonde hair attached. It was reported by Ghost Adventures when they came out to film at the Salt Air that Salt Air Sally had been dismembered, but this was not the case. The reason why her bones were scattered was really because of animal activity. Due to the position of the remains, police immediately began investigating it as a homicide. They began to distribute composite pictures, check dental records, missing persons records, to try to find out who this person was, but they didn't have any luck. The body was affectionately named Salt Air Sally, and it would take 12 years before police would find out who Salt Air Sally's real name was. 20-year-old Nicole Bacolis. Nicole Christina Bacolis, or Nikki, was born on August 23rd, 1980. She grew up in Renton, Washington with her three siblings, two sisters and a younger brother that was just one year younger than her. Nicole and her brother were very close growing up. Her brother describes her as just a very artistic and creative person. She loved painting, poetry, and her mother described her as a flower child and free spirit. She wasn't attached to material items. Her mom actually told a story that one Christmas, she asked Nicole what she wanted and Nicole answered that she just wanted a pair of jeans from the Goodwill. Nicole talked about how much she wanted a family when she grew up in a house with a white picket fence. In 1998, Nicole moved to Salt Lake City with her boyfriend, Joel Shadoin. Joel had found a job in the city and so they decided to move here together. However, they had a pretty tumultuous relationship being that they were both young. They struggled financially and Nicole eventually ended up developing a substance use disorder. After a couple run-ins with police, Nicole went back to Washington and entered treatment. And her mother said that when she got out of treatment, she was like a new person. Nicole's mom begged her to stay in Washington, especially considering she was pregnant, but Nicole really wanted to go back to Salt Lake. And so she came back and had a baby girl that she named Chloe. And she returned to Washington twice to see her family in 1999. And the last time that her mother remembered seeing her was as she boarded the plane to Salt Lake from Washington, holding baby Chloe in her arms. According to Nancy, Nicole was determined to make a new start and she was just really excited about being a mom and it was a very positive visit. Unfortunately though, after arriving in Salt Lake, things did not improve for Nicole and Joel. And in March of 2000, CPS was called and removed Chloe from the home because of the conditions. Chloe was put in temporary foster care before being placed with Joel's parents. Understandably, Nicole was devastated at the loss of her daughter and was working to get her back. And the last time that Nancy spoke to Nicole, she was talking about the fact that she had a hearing the next day and was planning on going to that. Unbeknownst to her family, Nicole disappeared on March 15th, 2000. 
2000 after a fight with Joel. They were in the process of breaking up and losing their apartment. At the time of her disappearance, Nicole was living in a hotel around 3300 South and Main Street, which is not a great area. In fact, that hotel is kind of known for overdoses, so it wasn't a great environment. Despite the fact that Nicole lived with Joel and they had gotten in an argument and she had never returned, Joel never reported her missing. Although when he was questioned by police, he did say that they had argued that morning or that day. When they didn't hear her, for her, Nicole's family figured that she just wanted to be alone and needed some time because of the trauma of losing Chloe. But they weren't really sure how to find her because she hadn't updated her address. They thought she was still living in Midvale when actually her and Joel had moved to South Salt Lake. Nicole was kind of a nomadic type of person and that was part of the problem. She, in the beginning, would contact her family and give them her address and make sure they knew where she was. But as things worsened between her and Joel, she wasn't so good at informing them of where she was, which created a huge problem when it came time to investigate her disappearance. Some of the news reports made it sound like her family wasn't concerned because they kept reporting that Midvale police hadn't received a police report about her being missing until 2003, but that actually wasn't the case. They reported her missing to Washington authorities early on. So for the next couple of years, Nicole's family continued to search for her, thinking that the police were also searching for her. They even hired a private investigator, but they were not successful. Eventually in 2003, the Midvale police were notified about Nicole's disappearance and began investigating it. While Nicole's family was still searching for her, Saltair Sally sat unclaimed. But in 2007, an opportunity arrived researchers at the University of Utah had developed a new DNA identification process. This technique, called stable isotope ratio mass spectrometry, or SIRMS, SIRMS is what we'll call it for short. This technique is able to determine the makeup of different ratios of isotopes in the molecules of the body. So in 2008, Salter Sally was the first body for SIRMS to be performed on. The team set out to recreate a timeline of the final years of Salter Sally's life. They cut strands of her hair into weekly increments. We can look at what was the person doing week by week. Was the isotope ratio from segment to segment of hair changing? If it was, then they were potentially moving and changing their drinking water. They discovered that Salter Sally had traveled, especially around the Pacific Northwest of the United States. So at this point, police knew they were actually looking for someone that may be from the Northwest. And so they began expanding their search outwardly. Now in 2011, Nicole's mother actually saw one of the sketches or facial reconstructions that investigators had put out and knew immediately that Salter Sally was her daughter. However, when she talked to investigators, they said that Salter Sally had been dead longer than her daughter had been gone and that Salter Sally was also the wrong size, weight, height, and that it just couldn't be her. However, they failed to take one thing into consideration. The fact that Nicole had been found on the shore of the Great Salt Lake meant that her body had been exposed to high levels of salt and winds, which actually made her body decompose faster than it would in a different environment. Nancy refused to give up though. She kept putting pressure on investigators to at least allow her to take a DNA test to see if her DNA matched with Saltair Sally's. In 2012, they discovered that Saltair Sally was Nancy Bacola's daughter, Nicole. Talk about a mother's instinct because when you look at those facial reconstructions and you look at the pictures with Nicole, they look nothing alike. I never would have guessed, but Nancy had that mother's instinct and she knew. On August 7th, 2012, it was announced in a press conference that Salter Sally had been identified as Nicole Bacolas. Now, they were never able to determine exactly how Nicole had died, but they do believe that she was murdered and then her body was dumped near Salter. So the investigation into who was Salter Sally became who killed Salter Sally, and unfortunately, that investigation is still ongoing. The results were bittersweet for her family. Nancy stated, for the last 12 years, every day I've been worried about, is she safe? Does she have a place to stay? Is she eating properly? Is someone abusing her? I think that's the 
good part, putting that to rest. I'm glad none of those things are happening to her. Her brother James also said, even though that they were relieved that they had finally found her, they had a million more questions because they didn't know what had happened or who had killed her. Nicole's boyfriend, remember him? Joel Shadoin or Shadon, who cares? He was arrested in 2019 for a different crime and sentenced to four years in a Washington state prison. He has been questioned by the police, but they've never had evidence to charge him. Unfortunately, Nancy passed away in 2017. And the only significantly that was really come in was a call made to the Utah Cold Case Coalition in 2020, where an anonymous caller just said, I killed the bitch and hung up the phone. Rude. I did speak to someone at the Utah Cold Case Coalition, and I just asked them if anything had happened in the case since 2020 or 2021. And he said that nothing has really happened, unfortunately. He did tell me that this was a situation that reminded him of Josh Powell. The person I spoke to at the Utah Cold Case Coalition said that someone else did come forward and offer information. Apparently it was an ex-partner, an ex-wife or ex-girlfriend of Joel, but they ended up disappearing. So the case is still unsolved. Now there are some questions such as why did it take police so long? Well, not only was it difficult because according to the Midvel police, they didn't get the information from Washington police. Utah also had a different police department for where Nicole actually lived. So they actually didn't know about the case until the two departments merged in 2011. So that added some additional confusion. Salt Air Sally has become an urgent legend. Like I said, the team from Ghost Adventures has been out there. It is said that she haunts the Salt Air. And according to the team, they heard disembodied voices at the location and one of them was pushed down the stairs. I'm not much into paranormal stuff, but I'm also not going to say it didn't happen. There have been some additional bodies found near Saltaire. In 2020, a woman from Salt Lake City was found out there, and I'm not sure that her murder has been solved either. Meanwhile, investigators are still searching for Nicole's killer. You can reach out to the Utah Cold Case Coalition or Ben Pender with the Unified Police Department if you have any information. Joel, I'm kind of talking to you. You want to you wanna say something? Get something off your chest? Especially now that you're getting out. I mean, we know you're going to go back in anyway, right? Because that's your pattern, dude. So let's um, come clean. So that is the story of Saltair Sally. And let me know what you guys think. Do you think she does haunt the Saltair? Do you believe in paranormal activity? I don't know if I do or don't. I've had some weird experiences myself, but I hope you found that interesting. And let me know what else you guys want me to talk about. Until then, remember who you are and what you stand for. I don't call it closure. I call it just peace of mind. She was just, just, a, just a very active, adventurous, down-to-earth girl that, you know, was really living a wonderful life. She sort of was a flower child born out of her time. She told me that all it would take to make her happy is the house, the white picket fence, and, and the little family. I mean, that's all she really wanted. I don't know that we will ever get the answers without the help of, of someone down here.